are not carriers. And even if you could detect every carrier in the country by testing all schoolgirls or something of that sort, you would still be left with that one-third of cases that are arising as spontaneous mutations, which you'd not be able to get at. And having some means of treatment would seem to me a very important part of one's long-term objectives. OK, we're going to have a race now, see who gets first back to money. The biggest single thing that we're hoping for is that we will go from just tracking chromosomes to actually knowing what the mutations are in most patients. If we knew what the gene actually made, and if we could test for that, then we wouldn't have to just infer whether the bad or the good chromosome had got into a particular person. We could actually test on a yes-no basis whether they were or were not affected, were or were not Carriers. And then looking further ahead than that, if we knew what the gene product was and what its function was, we might have some sort of opening towards actually being able to treat affected people. And that would be the biggest prize of all. Hazel's friends and family do all they can by raising money for research. When we found out that the kids had muscular dystrophy, we felt that we needed to be doing something. We've got to make the best of the situation as it is. So we try and get as much fun out of fundraising. For us, for the kids, we try and have fun and a laugh. We get the children very much involved. The kids absolutely love a jumble but especially the Christmas one. I think the kids are more excited over helping in the jumble than what they are at Christmas at the moment. They all come, they all do their little bit, and we aim to make a lot of money today. Come on, Christmas crackers, 125 a box, come on! Nah, they're not. I thought it was a bit Brenda. 10 p ticket. At six for fifty. Come and help our boys. Help research. Ninety-four percent of all the money paid in is all spent on research, and that makes me feel that people that support us in anything that we do for research, their money is going to the cause that they want it to go to. The muscular dystrophy group has a lot of branches all over the country, and all those branches make lots of money. The South East London branch always back us up. They always help us if we're short-handed or we want ideas. So far this year, with the help of the publicans who did the interval and the marathon runners and marathon tickets that we sold, we've done 13,500. And I reckon we'll have 15,000 before the end of the year. We came involved. Uh, I had a son. He died in 1956 at the age of 18. And uh, it was from there that I feel, you know, I'm a founder member of muscular dystrophy. And uh, still 30 years on, I'm still here. This is what I can do. I can make money for the group for research. It gives me the hope for the future because without the fundraising, we've got nothing. With the fundraising, we've got a lot of hope and we are getting there. I know we're getting there. From the head office to the littlest committee, we're all there for one thing, for muscular dystrophy, to find the answer. That's all our prayers are for. Please God, we'll be soon. In the United States, the Muscular Dystrophy Association is by far the biggest fundraising organisation, and they've successfully enlisted public support with the help of top show business entertainers. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr Jerry Lewis. Every August, on an American holiday, Labor Day weekend, Jerry Lewis hosts the annual Telethon, a round-the-clock television appeal broadcast all over North America. Thank you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. We're here to do some important work while at the same time trying desperately to entertain and to make it light, make it as light as we possibly can, uh, knowing all along there's nothing light about it. 
we uh, try to bring you the best possible show we can for the next uh, 22 and a half hours. And we try to do that with dignity, with respect, and with a deep concern for the reason that we're here. For the past 37 years, Jerry has been a key figure in the MDA's fundraising campaign. During that time, he's helped to raise $900 million for research into neuromuscular diseases. The hope is that the isolation of the Duchenne gene will lead to treatment not only of boys with the Duchenne form of the disease, but also to the treatment of people with other types of muscular dystrophy. We got the kind of research this year that could do it. It could do it. We've got the research dollars. The more we make, the more we can spend. The more you send, the more we can help. That's the name of the game. It really is an exciting, marvelous feeling to know that all of the work is not in vain, that we have a shot at it, that we can go to the pathologists and the scientists and the doctors and the people in therapy and say, here's your grant, here's the bucks, go into the lab. Now find the answers. Advances in genetics, with the need for more sophisticated equipment and larger research teams, have called for more and more money. In the last few years, fundraisers from the US, Britain and Canada have stepped up their efforts to help scientists to make that all-important breakthrough. In October 1986, the American Muscular Dystrophy Association called a press conference to announce the news that even seasoned campaigners had never really expected to hear. Thank you very much. Good morning. It is with a great deal of joy and emotion that I announce that a group of our scientists at Children's Hospital in Boston has discovered the gene for Duchenne muscular dystrophy. This is the most common, most cruel, and most deadly form of the disease. Dr. Lewis Kunkel and his research team at Children's Hospital and all of the scientists around the world who contributed to this great achievement have our heartfelt congratulations. They've worked virtually, night and day, for years to find the Duchenne gene. Can somebody explain to me how one goes about isolating genes? Say, come here, get out of here. <laughs> uh, that's a, a question that's really very difficult because it depends on the gene you're trying to isolate. Uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy was an example of a gene for which we had no idea what was wrong, what the product was, and we tried to use what's called reverse genetics. We knew where it was, now we'll go about trying to like a needle in a haystack, pick out everything else till you finally find the one that is the gene. And uh, that's basically what we did over the course of about three years. Kunkel's lead came from studying a Duchenne patient who had part of his X chromosome missing. That boy suffered from three X-linked diseases, Duchenne dystrophy, one, uh, chronic granulomas disease, and retinitis pigmentosa. <clears throat> so we have now three X-linked diseases and a deletion, a loss of material. And the, the assumption was that that loss of material was what resulted in the three X-linked diseases. And therefore, those three genes must reside within that region that's lost from that boy's DNA. And that just is the same region that both the genetic evidence with markers and the uh, translocation data had said was the region where Duchenne was. So now what we'd done, what had happened is the disease locus had been defined to be within the confines of that lost material, the deletion area. Morning, all. How are you doing? Morning. Tony's more if they could isolate from normal DNA the segment that was missing in the boy, then that segment should contain part of the Duchenne gene. But how could they identify what was missing? Kunkel's solution was a clever one. He took a large amount of the boy's DNA and compared it with a small amount of normal DNA that had been enriched with X chromosomes. 
He cut up the paired strands of normal DNA at precise points with an enzyme and then separated them. The sample of DNA from the boy was first separated before the strands were broken at random. When he mixed the fragments together, he got pairing between any that matched each other. Some of the boy's DNA reassociated with itself. Normal DNA readily found partners in the large amount of the boy's DNA. But in both cases, because the fragments were always of different lengths, the ends of these duplexes had long single strands sticking out. However, fragments of normal DNA from the region of the X chromosome missing in the boy could only pair with their original partners. And because these fragments had been cut precisely, they formed neat pairs that could be separated from the rest by cloning them in bacteria. So he isolated a number of segments of normal DNA whose absence in the boy caused the three diseases. One very small segment was also missing from a number of other patients with just Duchenne dystrophy. He had isolated a small segment of the Duchenne gene. The segment mapped within the dark band on the short arm of the X chromosome some distance away from the breakpoint. Here was the first marker for the gene itself. Using this marker as a starting point, he found stretches of DNA that overlapped with it on either side. And so he continued this technique of walking down the chromosome, extending further out in both directions. But how could he find out which parts of the stretch of DNA they had walked belonged to the Duchenne gene? I can't tell because of the RNA. Now, we had asked the people who were collaborating with us that they would make available to us the DNA of the patients with deletions. 